Okay. Uh, so, kind of wanted to, to talk about some of my processes um, and kind of explain this a little bit. Uh, but basically, uh, my motivation and uh, like my equipment upgrades I've done over the years that kind of brought me into trying to, I do a lot more when I do brew uh, now that I split my batches up into like two separate beers. Um, sometimes it's a little simpler, sometimes it's you know, a little more complicated. Um, all four beers that I brought today are actually examples I'll be talking about. So the Flemish Red Mood Brew, those are things I make from the same batch of wort. Uh, same thing with this golden and the uh, dark strong. Okay, so motivation wise, um, yeah, so there are so many different styles out there, but the one thing that I've noticed as a beer judge and then as a geek and you know, as a home brewer is that a lot of these styles are pretty similar. You know, and we want to make a lot of different things because we're used to going to the bar or the brewery and having more than, uh, I'm sorry for, you know, if the couple of Europeans around here, but when we go to the brewery, there's a lot of beers, not just the one, right? And when we go to the beer bar, that's, you know, they have many taps and we want to do the same thing at home. And uh, so I, you know, uh, almost 10 years ago, upgraded from a five gallon to a 10 gallon system. So I used to do just a boiled kettle that was like seven and a half gallons on a, on a turkey fryer and I had a picnic cooler that I used for mashing. It worked great. It probably still can. Um, but then I upgraded to this uh, bigger system and I'll explain that a little more later. Um, but you know there's always you know, I do a lot of uh, recipe development myself. I don't kind of necessarily go out and just grab somebody else's. I'll look at them, I'll use them for research, but you know, I kind of go on what I can get, what I can, and what I want to try to make. Um, so this added another wrinkle into the whole thing is how to make two good beers that are different out of my same afternoon in my garage. So. You know, the, the Snob Big Brew competition thing we've been doing for years, we all kind of start with the same wort, and there's never two beers that are the same here, right, when we do that. So that's a good example of how, you know, you can do a lot of things with, you know, one day of creating sugar water on a brew stand, and then what do I do afterwards? And so that way we can get a lot of variety, right? Uh, so, um, in 2012, I bought this 15-gallon uh, pot uh, direct fire system from uh, Ruby Street uh, through the Brew Mentor. Uh, and so, I kept on using the same carboys that I used to ferment in on my 5-gallon. I just used two of them instead of one. Um, and then, so instead of brewing once a month back then, now I'm doing maybe a little less. I mean, I, I was on that pace when I first got it, but that was a lot of beer. And it was against so-called laws about how much one person should be making a year, but well, I wasn't actually releasing all of it at the same time, no, right? That's why you have 17 roommates. Yeah. Right. Exactly. That's why, yeah, I was counting cats and, uh -huh. and animal, you know, all the deer in the yard. They, they all count. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. All right. So, and then um, 2016, um, I think I finally got into uh, fermentation control. And I got myself a chest freezer that I could have the two carboys in. And, you know, using a couple of... Uh, temperature controllers, I'm able, and thermo wells within, into the carboys, I'm able to like hold the temps. Um, I also found out that I could do two different temps at the, in the same chest freezer. So I could, the one that I want to be colder, I have run the chest freezer 
and the other one that wants to be warmer, it doesn't need to. It'll just warm itself up using the, the wrap, the wrap I have on that that's kind of like one of those aquarium warmer things. So these wraps go on the uh, uh, carboys. They also go on my newer things. And yeah, they're great because they'll hold and keep temp for me so that I can do a lager next to an ale in the same chest freezer at the same time, meaning I could do things where I'm splitting my batch into two, I could have more varied differences into, you know, the yeast I'm using. So then I, um, was it 2019? Yeah, so these have been around for a little while. These are great. Um, they're stainless steel buckets, okay, that kind of work like, like a uh, conical, but they're not. They're pretty lightweight, and so they've replaced my clean fermentation. Um, another cool thing is that it's a bucket with a lid, so if I want to ferment open, I can take the lid off. And so it's been great for my Hefeweizen and other things I want to ferment open, I can do that. And so I've, I've done experience where I made two Hefeweizens next to each other, one open, one closed, but yeah, I'm continuing making open Hefe. Um, they have handles, uh, the same wrap works on them, the same, uh, uh, you know, stopper fits the top, so thermal well in there. That's what's running right now at home. I've got uh, actually uh, two carboys full of Czech lager, same style completely, but I, I think one of those will probably end up being on the side pull at the four tapper uh, down the street from me instead of uh, at my house. So. Rick's gonna be able to have that and we'll be able to hang out there for more often. Um, yeah, so I only use these for clean. Um, there is a rubber gasket in the lid that I, I think I can replace, but I don't wanna do that very often. So I'm not putting any of my sours into these. I'm using my glass carboys or plastic, but for the most part, I do my primaries in my six and a half gallon glass and then for the sours and then you know i'm still using five gallons for uh secondary on this um yeah but they're great and i would recommend them as i am um, so then um first thing that i think i really did as a split batch uh i was already making flemish red i think i started uh what you have in your glass if you had any of that um, two batches I did in 2009 and I created a, a Solera Carboy and then every batch after that half of it comes out of that Carboy and half of it comes out of like a year old uh, copy of it and then the other half of the newer stuff goes on top of that car, uh, Solera and then it goes back into the closet for another year or two now. Um, I don't make it every year now. I'm, I think I'm on an every other year, but I'm still doing that. And I think it's holding up uh, flavor wise. It tastes, the, it has the same uh, characteristic no matter what. It's coming out malty yet sour and easy to drink. Um, and it did win a gold off this new blend. So. I think I'm just doing well. What's your vessel for that? Are you doing so that? So that, that, I'm just storing that in a class carboy, the Solera. It's got a normal stopper on it. Um, there are some cubes in there that I got through more beer that were part of a consecration kit. So they're consecration barrel cubes from Russian River. But other than that, that's just been, you know, <coughs> so many years of the same kind of beer. A couple of different um, 
yeast blends, but for the most part, most of it's Rosalaire. Is it undergoing a secondary fermentation in there or is it all clean beer? What I normally do on mine is one month of primary in the six and a half, and then I transfer it into a five um, gallon, and then that sits for uh, nine months to a year before I blend that into uh, what I end up kegging for. Um, so, cool. Yeah. You just have to be patient, and if you keep, you know, a keg of this around, you can be patient with it. Yeah. But, so, I was making this, and now I have a 10-gallon system. I don't need another five gallons of Flemish Red. Yeah, I do, but um, what else can I do with this? And so, looking through the guidelines a little bit, knowing my Belton Sours, I can make a new brew that's not much that different from Flemish Red. What's different is the coloring, a little more richness of, of flavor. So um, what I can do is probably just darken that other half of that. Um, there are products out there like a Cinemar or a Malta Firm from Breeze that are an ex a malt-based extract that you know, you could just darken it. Or, you know, if I, sometimes I only collect nine gallons, but I need 10 for this process. So I'll make a one gallon batch on the stove, maybe the next week, and do a Munich, Cara Munich, Carafa special, kind of one gallon batch, to then put that into the oud brew. And so this is kind of my recipe. Normally what I do here is that for my Flemish Red, um, for 10 gallons, it's 11 pounds of Vienna, four pounds of pills, two pounds of aromatic, two pounds of flake maize, um, a Karamunic, like a mid 40 to 60 love Karamunic. It's tough to find a good Belgian Karamunic anymore. We all have our issues. Uh, special B, another thing that's tougher to find, but I, I search out for that. I do a 158 simple single infusion mash on these. I don't do anything crazy with my sours. I just mash hot, and that seems to work for me. Uh, 10 to 15 IBUs of hops. I don't care what it is. It's just 10 to 15 IBUs, right? So whatever you have. Try to minimize the green character, so... 10 to 15 I'd use a Magnum or something big. Hey, that's like half an ounce. It's not gonna affect anything. And give me more liquid. Good, good way to use up those yeah. handful of this, handful of that. Right, right. Too. And then uh, Y Yeast makes this Rosalaire blend. It is Saccharomyces, it's Pret, it's Pedio. Lacto, Pedio, and maybe another. No, it's those four. Yeah, it's at least those four. It's a micro menagerie of fun, and I just get normally like two snack packs per five gallons, um, and just let go on those. I I don't want to make a um, a yeast starter with a blend because all those guys are in a certain uh, percentage that works right to pitch. So I I might as well give them just more. So I'd rather have two packs than one for five gallons. And so, like one of my one gallon, uh, yeah, Mu so Pilsner Munich, uh, Gold Swan Brown, figured try it, it's 110, you know, whatever. And then a little bit of Malta Firm, which is the, what is that, 350 SRM at the, yeah, it, it's, Nice and dark and easy to, and then, you know, a uh, little, little stronger. But so the Flemish red, and you can see the two of them. They're that, you know, that's the Oud Brun. That's the Flemish red. I mean, they came from the same batches, but, you know, a little bit of uh, persuasion by, you know, using a little another 
another bit of darkness. Um, I'll get there, and they do taste a little different. You can taste that gold swan brown, I think, in this. It's got that little toastier note to it. It's kind of cool. But both of these beers are malt forward sour beers, right? They, they work well if you have the malt and the sourness. If they're just straight sour, they're not going to be great. So I get a question like, yep. like the malt firm, is that basically just like food coloring? Yeah, well, so malt firm is the Brees uh, malt extract that made for uh, more coloring than flavor. And yeah, you can get it as a powder form. Uh, yep. Cinnamar is the Vireman one that's liquid. I think malt firm now comes liquid, but I haven't used that one yet. So what do you do, just put that in more water to kind of... You can, you can, but like this time around, I used it in my one gallon uh, batch anyway, so... Yeah, so what I ended up getting was 25 SRM, so I'm taking this 14 and, and move, you know, just bumping it up a, a couple SRMs to go from, say, your 14 to your 16, 18. I'm making two nice beers that are different off the same brew days. Okay, two or three brew days. Or it, I don't, I can't even count how many brew days I've had of, <laughs> that might be in your glass here in the Flemish Rack, right? Because it's all on the Solera. All right. Um, another option, uh, so I don't have this with me. I made this last year. Um, I like making the Hefeweizen but I don't necessarily want to have 10 gallons of half of ice around. That's 80 pints of half A. That's, I like it. I don't know if I, I can get through that much of ice first. It's a good weekend anyway. It's right? Weekend. Yeah, it's a weekend. Uh, so I started splitting my half of ice in with American wheat, and that worked out pretty well. You know, it's a, I do like a 65% wheat, which isn't necessarily American wheat, but if I just dry hop that and use a American ale yeast, that seems to work and usually does well enough in competitions. But um, Omega, I think two years ago maybe, maybe la early last year, uh, came out with these stylized uh, yeasts where through GMO they've created or helped create yeast that will take on thiol precursors and create more uh, tropical hop character than if you don't, yeah, it's crazy. So what's happening here is on this yeast, if you mash hop with say saws, uh, you can get crazy Tropical fruit character off of it. And how is it volatile? Does it go away? Or? It is actually more shelf stable than dry hopping. Wow. I have found, um, and I think they, their research shows the same, is that that'll stick around a little better. Um, yeah, that pail held up for a while uh, last summer. So, um, you know. Hazy IPAs and pails are a thing, and it's not something I make often, but this seemed to work great for me was that I could make them a half of ice in. It's probably not gonna take much just to throw some saws in the mash. They're, it's not gonna change the hefe much at all. And I can come out with a hefe that's pretty much my hefe, and then have a pale ale that has all this great um, Tropical fruit character. How does it compare with if you put like a like a Simcoe or something? Does it well does it enhance it even further? Or? Yes. So what so what I did with this um, was that I created two beers off of this. Um, that my half of bison, sixty five percent pale, uh, thirty thirty one percent pills, uh, sigillated malts, some melanoidin. Um, and then I, my half of ice and step mash is 
10 minutes at 110, 20 minutes at 120, 50 minutes at 150, 165 mash out, and um, that's why I'm using the melanoidin is because I'm just not doing a decoction on this. But uh, so what this I did this time around is I put four ounces of saws in the mash, which ended up being about five IBUs. So it's not going to be anything that's going to ruin a half of for sure. I then threw on like seven IBUs of a newer German a high alpha hop called Hercules. So, and then uh, 90 minute boil. Um, I, I like White Labs 380 is my favorite Hefe yeast because uh, I, I get more clove than banana and that's the way I like them. Uh, fermented at 66. So that's the open fermenter over here on the, on the screen. And then the one with the hops on them, that's the pale ale. Uh, so Omega's Cosmic Punch, which is their uh, hazy IPA uh, thialized yeast. It's, uh, a, they've taken one of their British strains, probably uh, the one that was Boddington's. And they've used, they've done some CRISPR work to turn that to, you know, add this dial uh, precursor um, tool. And then, so I did like high Kreuzen. So this is what, this would have been day after I pitched. Um, that's why the Hefe hasn't grown too much yet, but it's getting there. Um, I threw in an ounce each of Lotus and Sabro. And then I did the same thing for a dry hop later. But I fermented that at 68, where as the Hefe is sitting next to it, uh, connected to the cooler with a little cooler temperature. And I brought these in last year for our uh, yeast uh, forward beers. So it was, it was kind of fun to show off. I could do Hefe and this off the same batch. And it's kind of why I wanted to talk about them. Um, and then the next thing I want to talk about was Trappist Ales. So another trap sales are a lot you know there's so many different ones uh, out there but um, they have varying strengths and colors and malt character and the old recipes that I used to see out there had all these crazy malts and you had to do this 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 and this and, but then some of the newer recipes were showing more of just like straight pills or uh, and then just use the candy syrup sugars to get you where you need to be. Uh, so my thoughts were, can I make a Belgian blonde and a quad from the same batch? And um, so that's what I attempted to do earlier this year. Was, you know, go with that simple Pilsner batch. Um, and yeah, the other thing was, the trap sales go on, on a Play-Doh number? That doesn't make sense to me. Like how is a 10, 10.8% alcohol? A 10 would be like a 1040 start. Oh gee, right? So my thoughts are that is like a 1040 Pilsner beer that then they just throw the sugars on. I don't know, that's just a thought. So that's what I went to try to do was, you know, with a simple Pilsner beer, can I then take that and make two separate Belgian beers? One being the blonde that isn't gonna to take too much sugar, but a little bit, because you wanna dry it out a little that way. Uh, and then a dark strong that's gonna have all the fun syrups that you can find to make those. Uh, BJCP wise, a Belgian blonde is six to seven and a half percent, uh, fifteen to thirty IBUs. The OG is ten sixty two to ten seventy five, and four to six SRM color wise. So that's you know, golden, straw yellow to golden, uh, dark strong eight to twelve, um, and then twenty to thirty five IBU. And then a starting gravity or an OG of 75 to 1110. And then 
SRM of 12 to 22, so light copper up to dark brown. So uh, yeah, uh, so what I tried to do was target uh, 12 Play-Doh or 1048 Pilsner beer, and then play with sugars. Um, so that's what we have here on tap. Um, but as you noticed, I'm calling it a golden strong instead of a blonde. Uh, I overshot my gravities. Um, so I, I used 24 pounds of uh, house malts Pilsner. I mashed at 150 for, and then I boiled for 90 minutes. Uh, Peco is a Pacific Northwest, um, pretty simple hop, but it's a high alpha, like, I don't know, 20. And it's it's got some more continental character to it. So I've been using it for my uh, saisons and things like that, so I had it around. Um, I did add a pound of turbinado uh, to the end of the boil. And and then, so then my blonde, I used a WLP 500 or Chimay, pitched at 65, let it rise for like a day and a half. And then what I normally do with my Belgian beers is every day I go in and just bump up the temp one or two degrees until I get to a point where I want it to stop and I just let it go until it's terminal. So uh, the target was 1068. For the blonde, uh, the target for my strong was actually only 1078, uh, but basically do the same thing. But then I rewarmed up the word after I pulled the first five gallons out, and I threw in two pounds of demerara, another raw uh, cane sugar, and then I used the West Mall yeast, and then I think. Probably put these in before I pitched, but two pounds of uh, D45 and one pound of D180. So that's where all the color comes from between the two. Um, and then, yeah, uh, kind of followed the same ferment. So that was my plan. Actually, um, what happened was that I overshot my gravities. Um, I need to update the equipment profile in Beersmith because 72% is not what I hit normally. And then when I play with house malts, especially the spills, I get crazy uh, efficiency from what I was planning. So I hit 1074 instead of 1068 on what I had planned. It's a little bit, a little bit off. Um, so, uh, and then it dropped down to 1010, like I wanted it to. So it's an eight and a half percent. That's no longer necessarily a blonde. It drinks like a blonde. Though. It does. I was confused but, when I saw the label because it says golden strong. Yeah. I tasted it, I'm like, that's a blonde. Maybe it's, maybe I'm tasting it wrong. And then mm -hmm. that's a blonde. I'm like, oh, there, there's. Yeah, the but, but, but golden, golden strong, strong should also taste like a blonde. But a lot drier. Yeah, yeah, I can. This, this has a little more of that. I think the alcohol is kicking in some of that mm -hmm. residual sweetness. So yeah. I call it a blonde, and this thing would be perfect as yeah. a blonde. I mean, Greg Irving would call this a blonde, yeah. right? I mean, his... That's what I have. Yeah. Or you could just dilute it, couldn't you? After you could. You, you could. Get it where you want it. And then the uh, quad, uh, my OG on that was 1090. Um, now, it only dropped to 1020, and one of my issues... One of, my realizations was I should have used some yeast nutrient, especially with all the sugars. Next time around, if I try this, yeast nutrient. Um, and then the other thing would be to update my uh, equipment profile at Beersmith to be like 75, 77% efficiency instead of 72. Um, yeah. But I, I think they came out pretty well for what they are. Um, yeah. A uh, couple of other things I've, I've made in the past. Uh, Kolsch and lager. So the day we were supposed to host uh, NHC Cleveland in 2020, I had already planned to make 
uh, a, these beers the weekend after, but hey, I had a free weekend. So that Saturday, I ended up making my Kolsch, and half of that I gave uh, 3470 or the Vine Stefan uh, Lager East. And so when I was done drinking my Kolsch on my patio by myself, I then started my <laughs> lager. Okay, so I, this was a nice way to like spread out uh, the early, the late spring, early summer of our first year of COVID. Um, of course, Doppelbach and Eisbach, we were, Andrew and I have been making that, made that a few times now. Uh, we make 10 gallons of Doppelbach and then take five, you know, a keg of that and turn that into ice block by accidentally leaving it outside on the polar vortex. Um, accidentally. Accidentally. Uh, leaving the chest freezer on full power. Um, one way or another, he gets there. That's technically distilling. Yes. It's not. It's okay. It kind of, but. It's homebrewing. You're allowed to do anything you're so, uh, does anyone have any suggestions of things that, yeah? I, I did a split batch of a, uh, uh, like 50% wheat and did a Goza, and I just did, set that off to the side mm -hmm. and do it as a kettle sour. Yep. And the rest of it I split off and did like a table strength that's on with. Nice. So like doing a kettle sour, part of it's nice, because you literally don't have to do anything else with it that day. You just take every, the, the second half of the word and just brew with it mm -hmm. and let the kettle sour do its thing for a couple. Yeah, I mean, that's so, there are ways to come up with, like, if you want to have that variety, there are ways to make more than one beer from the same brew day, and unlike what Andrew might do, where he does two or three beers in the same day on this five-gallon system, like, well, you can make two separate beers. You could do part of guile as well. You can also do party guile, which I didn't bring up in this presentation, but uh, yeah, I mean, that's another way to go. Is so party guile would be do a, wee, a wee heavy and a mild or something. Yeah, yeah, you could do a stronger beer and a lighter beer by when you stop the runnings of the first beer, right? And uh, I think uh, who was it? Uh, Fuller's will do two separate mashes and make three or four beers party guile through those so that they got a strong ale. They've got their ESB, they have their bitter, and then they have something smaller. All off of that same kind of two mashes. So. You know, it, it, the other piece of it is time, right? I mean, if, yes. you're, if you're in it, you know, I have a similar electric, but similar mm -hmm. size system. And, you know, I did five gallon batch yesterday. Pretty sure I could have done 10 in the same side time. You know, yeah. A little, and little bit extra time to do because I do steps. It would have been mm -hmm. a little longer. I have done that, that Kolsch and Lager thing up several times now because it just, I have a, a good standard strength beer. And then when that's done, the other half of that's been lagered. Yeah, I just need, so I'll, I'll be off to mm -hmm. Home Depot or Lowe's for another chest freeze. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I can do two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the side by side in the chest freezer with two thermostats works great for me. And I have been able to do, you know, Kolsch and Lager isn't that different of a temp difference, right? Yeah. Um, but I've done other things that are maybe a little warmer. But, you know, the other thing is you can start a, a, a lager, you know. Start it warm and then bring it down. If well, you start it. What, I, what I've done is more of the quicker, like, uh, Narcisse, is that it? Yep, Narcisse, yes. It, where you, you know, you start off with, like, normal lager temps, but then, you know, a few days in, you're at, you know, 55, 56% you know, degrees, and, you know, by the end of the week, you're in the 60s with it. Yep. So that, then you're not really worried you know, too much about blowing out. Yeah, it's really only the first yeah. lager, the, the first mm -hmm. four or five days. Yep. Once, once you're past that, you can let it, let I, it come up. I think the easy way to get into this was probably a couple experiments you and I mm -hmm. did back in the day. It was simple work that could go a lot of different directions and just have yeah. fun with three or four different yeasts. 
Sure. Say that's yeah. going to be a pale ale, but that one's going to be a saison. Mm -hmm. This one's going to be the Belgian blonde. This one's going to be I don't know a black IPA. And yes, yeah. yeah. Cinnamon. Yeah. But I love what you've done with a couple of the really unique little twists. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's really cool. Yeah, I, I I will definitely use that dialyzed yeast and and again. Cool. And especially with my half egg because that seemed to work great. And if you if you add uh, uh, an iso pulp extract. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's the other, yeah, that's the other thing. It's like I'm not necessarily playing with bitterness much, but yeah, if I used a I summarized hop extract, I can get that for half of that, so I could, you know, make something stronger in bitterness than I could do. Yeah. 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 Well, those yeah, if some of them I don't think you need to necessarily boil. You just have to you know, blend that into the, the work. Yeah, it's like the new dry hop. Yeah. Cool. But yeah, I mean, play with different yeast, play with different, and there are so many different styles, as I was saying, that, like, Belgian Pale and ESB, those are basically the same beer. They're just different yeasts, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But don't taste the same. All right. Uh, any more questions? Good work. All right. Uh, well, I'm going to probably need 10 to 15 minutes to work on the raffle prizes before I'll be ready for those. But um, thanks for. Good work, guys. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for staying